It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Changemakers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Perfectionism is something many people strive to achieve. It can drive high standards and motivation. But according to today's guest, Dr. Greg Chasson, perfectionism does not necessarily equate to excellence. He contends that those who establish a high standard of ideals for themselves often become paralyzed because they're afraid that they'll make mistakes or fail to meet expectations. He joins us today to offer practical strategies to manage perfectionism. Dr. Chasson is a licensed clinical psychologist and board-certified cognitive behavioral therapist. He's the author of Flawed, Why Perfectionism is a Challenge for Management. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a delight. So, Doctor, this is an interesting conversation because many people, myself included, we're really hard on ourselves, and, and we expect a lot of ourselves. So, for the sake of conversation, how is perfectionism defined? I think perfectionism is defined in two ways, um, or at least with two uh, primary components. The first is rigidity, cognitive rigidity. And this really manifests or looks like somebody who has a difficult time shifting their mindset, their perspective. And then as a result, they have a difficult time shifting their behavior. So it might come across as a little bit stubborn. I don't know if that word is the best descriptor. I don't know that there's uh, a negative connotation to it other than it can be pretty maladaptive. But it's somebody who sort of stays the course and has a hard time changing course. I think perfectionism, that's a hallmark of perfectionism. The other component is excessive expectations. So we all shoot for, for outcomes that are really positive and strong, and I would never suggest shooting for something that's subpar. But people with perfectionism tend to really push for things that are unreasonable or infeasible to accomplish. What do you think is at the root of this type of behavior? This is a good question. I'm not sure that we know the full answer to that, but I would say a large part of it is both social and related to anxiety. The social component is that we often are comparing ourselves. We're very social creatures. And I think that as we're constantly engaging in upward and downward comparison with people, uh, especially with this thing called social media that seems to be taking hold. I really think that it's uh, really, really become a major problem where we're comparing ourselves to others. And I think that feeds into a perfectionistic mindset, especially since we're always feeling like we're being observed or being uh, judged. And I think the anxiety plays a big role as well. I think at the core of perfectionism is an anxiety that we're an imposter or that we're not doing enough or that it's not good enough. Anxiety is often a precursor and drives a lot of behaviors that get in the way procrastination, avoidance, rituals, things like seeking excessive reassurance from the people around us. Did I do this okay? How am I doing? Are you okay? And other types of behaviors that get in the way, even things like excessive confessing or apologizing. These are things that often are driven by anxiety, which in turn are driven by a perfectionistic mindset. A lot of what you just described to me sounds like it does correlate with the way you see yourself, your your level of self-esteem. And do you agree with that? Does it have a lot to do with the way we see ourselves? Definitely. I think self-esteem is, is a major component that connects with perfectionism. You know, I think that it, it very well could be, I, I don't know that self-esteem and perfectionism has been well-researched, but it's an area where I believe there would be a ton of connection. And I think that when you start to look at self-esteem, it probably leaks into things like perfectionism and how that even relates to, to narcissism. And I could probably wax poetic on this for, for days, but the bottom line is, is that self-esteem is a very important factor when looking at perfectionism and how we perform and trying to optimize our performance and also how we engage in impression management with the people around us. If you had asked me a while back where I thought perfectionism came from, I would have said probably 
the type of pressure that's put on you as a child growing up. But now that I'm getting older, I think it does have a lot more to do with self-esteem, the way we see ourselves. Well, I think that those are those are linked. Uh, so I don't know that it's an or. Uh, I think it's a, an and. <clears throat> and I really believe that it's a mixture of components. I do think that it's about the way the kids are being raised. You know, there's some research coming out by Tom Curran that suggests that perfectionism is growing across generations and over cohorts. I think that we're seeing a more a more uh, stringent and achievement-based culture as we move forward in our society. And I think that, of course, dovetails with our self-esteem and how people are looking at ourselves. A lot of these things are driven by our own internal expectations, but they're also driven by the expectations of other people. And we sometimes project these expectations on other people as well. So there are really three different ways that this can play a part. And I'd also don't want, I think I would be remiss not to mention that there is a genetic and, and biological component. I think that better connects to personality type and anxiety, but the genetics certainly are there as well. What happens, doctor, if we stay on this trajectory of, of the things you described about society? What's going to happen to us and our children? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I wish I had that foresight. I'm not entirely sure what that's going to look like, but I imagine it will be a lot of pressure. A lot of people feeling like they need to perform optimally in order to fit in. As you indicated, self-esteem, it might tank uh, even more so. And I think a lot of uh, society will be valuing things that, that are probably not super adaptive and things that we are not you know, designed as such to, to really pursue. Things like you know, impression management and, and, and uh, other types of values that are related to social judgment. Are there varying degrees of perfectionism? Absolutely. It's a dimension. So we all fall somewhere on there. It's a lot like height or income in that we're, you know, all relative to each other, whereas some people are tall, some people are, are less tall. And just like that, there are some people with extreme and debilitating perfectionism. These are the people that I see come into my clinic, do a lot of cognitive behavior therapy, do a lot of behavioral exercises, a lot of challenging of, of difficult thoughts. And then there are people on the other extreme that are so flexible in their thinking that sometimes they might need to be a little bit more decisive and rigid in the way that they approach things. The Goldilocks zone, right in the middle, that's where most of us fall, or especially people that have worked on their perfectionism. And I think that is the goal of not only my book, Flawed, but also any services that you get from my clinic is to move people towards the middle. Well, yeah, because we've been talking about the negatives of it, but what are some of the positive aspects of being a perfectionist? There's quite a lot of them. I would never suggest avoiding hiring a perfectionist or avoiding them altogether. They could be some of your best employees or some of your, your best contributors. They can be honest and loyal. They tend to have really high levels of conscientiousness, which is a huge blessing for a work setting. They can also be very detail-oriented. So if you need somebody to really make sure that those details are getting covered, perfectionist is your go-to. So there are lots of positive qualities, and I think those positive qualities can be nurtured. And some of the negative consequences of perfectionism can be reduced with a little bit of change in the setting, in the context. What would you say to someone who's listening to you right now who wants to take a chance, maybe start a business or go for a new job or, or whatever it may be in, in that person's life, but because they have this need for things to turn out the quote-unquote right way, they never take that chance. What would you say to that someone to get started moving into that Goldilocks zone? That's a great question. I would actually uh, hand them chapter uh, five of my book. And I would say, this is a framework that I use for thinking about approaching tasks, such as starting a business. I call it the emphasis framework. It's really based on values and effort. And I call it emphasis framework because I see there being three broad categories. Now, they're not mutually exclusive. We all fall somewhere in between these. But the first approach would be emphasis A, which is to Lean in with 110%, give it your all, do everything you possibly can. This is it. This is super important to you. Then there's emphasis B, which is just the get or done strategy. Just get it done. Doesn't need to be perfect. Doesn't need to be awful. Just get it done. And then there's the emphasis C strategy, which I consider the don't do it at all, purposefully. It's a strategic move. And so there's a time and place for all three of these different approaches there's not really a judgment on what's better or worse. It really depends on the nature of the task and most importantly, how valuable it is to you. So there's a time and place for all three of these. 
emphasis A is excellent if something is really important to you. Maybe you're going to take the LSAT for law school and you want to give that your all. Makes a lot of sense. Emphasis B is something that you probably would opt to do for uh, to be most adaptive. You would opt to do it for most tasks. Most things in life don't warrant your top attention. And so I would suggest that most things in life ought to be emphasis B. And then there are definitely things that are strategically emphasis C. And I always use the example of the customer service call at the end of you know talking to your, your cell phone carrier. I'm not really entirely sure that I've ever answered those questions. I think I emphasis C the daylight out of those. And you know I think that's strategic. It's just not valuable to me. So I, I really think that it's about the, the, the context of the task. And the problem with perfectionism is that people emphasis A way too many things. Wait, their ratio is off. So they emphasis A way too many things or they attempt to, and they don't emphasis B or C enough things. So what I try to do is get them more aligned with people who are not as perfectionistic, in which case emphasis B is much more commonly used. And I try to flip the ratio for those who are perfectionistic so that it's a little bit more aligned with this. Doing this is extremely anxiety provoking for somebody with perfectionism. It's essentially asking them to do things in a way that's less intense and less effortful than they think should be done. And in doing so, it's essentially an exposure therapy exercise, which is what we do in cognitive behavior therapy. No matter which approach you take, how important is it to learn how to accept the outcome? Because things aren't always going to work out as planned. And and I know in my own life, when I went through a lot of trauma, I had this story that I had written for my life, as, as we all do. And I remember the words that would come out of my mouth quite frequently when I would say, that's not how it's supposed to be. Like, supposed to be were words right. that really governed the way I was living. And so how important is it to learn to accept that even when you do your best, it may not work out the way you planned? Oh, I think that's such an important lesson in life uh, for anything that you do. In fact, I think at the core of perfectionism is a misunderstanding of control. I really believe that people with perfectionism overestimate how much control they have in these situations when really there's not that much we can control and the things that we can, often we don't even control enough. But for the perfectionist, they're often trying to control all these variables that are just not controllable And sometimes it even takes a magical quality. I have to do this, which is completely out of your control. Somehow you can start to control the weather and the future and, you know, whether aliens come down to earth. It's really difficult to control all these variables. And I I think that that's what people with perfectionism are attempting to do. So in in essence, what you described is very much the end goal of what we're trying to do here with, with my book and with any services that you get is can we get you to accept the, the amount of control you do have in situations and give up that control in order to allow those things you that are sort of outside the scope of what you can do, just allow them to be and to sit with that. It's a very difficult exercise. It's a very difficult strategy, especially when you've always learned that you have total control and that you should do everything within your power to try to fight things. But it's just oftentimes it's out of your control. Yeah, It's about giving up the best use of your control sometimes is to give it up. Mm -hmm. Because we equate a lack of control with weakness. I think that that's true for a lot of society. Uh, You know, I don't know that that's true worldwide, but yeah, I think, which is interesting, right? Because I think learning to use your control to give up that control is probably the most powerful and strongest thing you can do. I agree. When you stop trying to control everything, that's really a sign of power. I agree. And I think it's a very difficult lesson that not everyone gets to. And this idea of supposed to be really aligns well with this concept of the should statement, which I talk about in my book. The should statement is something that I think enslaves us all, but it's a matter of degree. So I personally have worked on this myself because should statements have taken over my life. I should do this. I should be this way. I should be a good athlete. I should be a good parent. I should be a good podcast host. I should be a good radio host. I should be good in bed. I should, I mean, it just goes on and on and on in this whole world sometimes feels like a giant should statement. And so I think that supposed to feels very much like a should statement. And it's one of those things that we will target and attack when working with employees who are struggling with perfectionism. Can you give us one strategy that will help someone who lives by the should statement? 
Yeah, I believe the best things to do are behavioral. So in the book, I introduce one wacky concept that I, I think would be a bit difficult to implement, but could be quite useful, which is to enhance cognitive fle flexibility and reduce one's ability to, to predict what's happening next. And I call it the, uh, I call it the um, random daily structure, where you have a certain number of tasks that a job might require, and you randomize those every single day that your employee comes in so that they're dealing with the lack of predictability, the lack of structure, and fighting these beliefs about what should be done and in what should be done in what order. And you're essentially teaching them that they could handle this kind of a pivot every morning and that they could be flexible and most importantly, that they could handle the anxiety that comes with it. Mm -hmm. And that's a strategy that can be applied to any area of a person's life. Absolutely. It doesn't even need to be in work. I often tell people the, uh, the, the secret of my book is that it actually could apply way outside of the workplace, but it's hard to write a book for everyone on the planet. So, But you could take the lessons in the book and you could absolutely apply them outside. And once again, that book is Flawed, Why Perfectionism is a Challenge for Management. Doctor, where can our listeners go to learn more about you and your work? Uh, you could go to flawedbook.com, which is a bit of a an unfortunate URL, but it's, uh, it is what it is. Maybe it's in the spirit of anti-perfectionism. Flawedbook.com. And you can also go to my website, gregchasson.com. C-H-A-S-S is in Sam, O-N is in Nancy.com. And you can learn some more. You could even pick up a couple of, uh, of a couple of free chapters as a sneak peek. See if you like it, take it for a test drive and then, uh, and then see how it goes. Doctor, in our final moments, what is the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? I think the best uh, message to pass along here is that people with perfectionism are very multifaceted. So this, the intent of this book, the, in, the point of my reaching out and pushing this message is not to vilify people with perfectionism. It's not, to, it's not a witch hunt. If you've got perfectionism, I'd like you to take home the message that there are things about this quality that get in the way and cause difficulties. And if you work with someone with perfectionism or you live with someone with perfectionism, there are things you can do to loosen their thinking patterns and their behaviors. And there is a way to maximize their good qualities like loyalty and honesty and conscientiousness and detail uh, orientation. And you can do that while also minimizing some of the difficulties that come with it as well. So this, again, is not uh, about attacking perfectionists. It's about lifting them up to change. Dr. Chasson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, CYA, CYL.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.